This morning, I'm reading from Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. The Word says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, both now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of His holy word. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, God Almighty has made us so many promises. And one of them is this one, this precious one, that He surrounds us. If we belong to Him, if we know Him, if we are His children, He surrounds us and protects us. And I look on my life and I see many times that God's been there, even through the hard times. And I'm sure it's true for you. So we come here today to worship and to humble ourselves before God. Would you pray a prayer with me, a repentant prayer? Would you lift up your hearts and voices with me? Would you pray for yourselves and pray for each other and pray for this service? Pray that we would please God Almighty. In the name of Jesus, let us go to the Lord now in prayer. Mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. For there is no other God. You are the one and only God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. And Lord, you are holy and righteous without sin, Lord. But Lord, we have rebelled, Lord. You made us in your image. And we are sinners. We are weak, Lord. We are human beings, Lord. And sometimes we don't even know it, Lord. But your Spirit convicts us, Lord. And we come to you through the blood of Jesus. For he is your Son. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. And he was died on the cross. He became our sin. And he made a way for us. And he raised, Lord. And he blood raised in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit with us, Lord. Let us worship you in spirit. Let us come into your presence, <coughs> Lord, not because we are worthy, but because of what you have done for us and for your name's sake. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Father, I thank you for every soul and every family, Lord, that's represented, that takes part in this service. I know, Lord, they're special to you because you died for them, Lord, and your love endures forever. You tell us, Lord, in your word that you're always there waiting for us, Lord, with open arms. Let us come to you now, Lord. Let us worship you in spirit. Lord, separate us. Separate us from our sin. <coughs> we repent, Lord. We come before you as sinners, Lord, and we claim the sacrifice of Jesus. And we need your strength and we need your guidance, Lord, so may your spirit, your Holy Spirit, be strong with us, Lord. And may, Lord, what we do and say, Lord, be pleasing to you. May we put it away, the world, Lord. Let us not worry about yesterday or today or even tomorrow, Lord, but to give this time to you. Let us be humble before you. Because you are God, and you are our God. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. I want to ask everyone, please stand with me this morning. Please stand with me. As we go to the Lord in worship, I ask that you repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. The, Lord is the Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're taking your seats, turn with me in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 2. We're continuing through the Old Testament, getting real close to the end. Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 through 16 this morning. And Sister Wazel will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Wazel, please. 하나님의 말씀 말라기 2장 10절 16일입니다. 우리는 하나 아버지를 가지지 아니하여니 하나님께서 주신 바가 아니냐 어찌하여 우리가 각 사람이 자기 형제에게 거치서 행하여 우리 조상들의 언약을 욕되게 하느냐 
유다는 거짓을 행하였고 이스라엘과 예루살렘 중에서는 가정한 일을 행하였으며 유다는 여호와께서 사랑하신 그 성결을 욕되게 하여 이방신의 딸과 결혼하였으니 이 일을 행하는 사람에게 속한 자는 깨는 자나 응답하는 자나 물론이요 만군의 여호와께서 제사를 드린 자도 여호와께서 야구의 장목 가운데서 끊어버리시리라 내가 이런 일도 행하나니 곧 눈물과 울음과 탄식으로 여호와의 재단을 가리게 하는도다 그러므로 여호와께서 다시는 내의 봉헌물로 돌아보지 아니하시며 그것을 너희 손에 기꺼이 바치지 아니하시고는 너희는 이러기를 어찌 됨이냐이까 하는도다 이는 너와 내게 어려서 맞이한 아내 사이에 여호와께서 정인이 되시기 때문이라 그는 내 짝이요 노아서 약한 아내로서 내가 그에게 거짓을 거짓을 행하였도다 그에게는 영이 충만하였으나 오직 하나를 만들지 아니하셨느냐 어찌하여 하나만 만드셨느냐 이는 경건한 자손을 얻고자 하심이라 그러므로 내 심령을 상가시켜 어려서 마지한 아내에게 거짓을 행하지 말지니라 이스라엘 하나님 요가 이뤄놓으니 나는 이혼하는 것과 옷으로 학대를 가리는 자를 미워하노라 만군의 요와의 말이니라 그러므로 너희는 심령을 상가 지켜 거짓을 행하지 말지니라 아멘 아멘 Malachi chapter 2 <coughs> verses 10 through 16 Have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A detestable things have been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant, has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message. And, Lord, I thank you for the people who receive it, Lord, with glad hearts and soft hearts. And, Lord, let us all have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. May, Lord, we please you in all things, and may this be a blessing to you and your kingdom, and may we draw near to you through this message. And through this time, for it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our relationships. You know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about and think about our relationship with God. God made us all as a people who have relationships with each other. From the very beginning, God has made a covenant with humans. Genesis 9, 8 says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Exodus 34, 10 says, Then the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I the Lord will do for you. Amen. You know, in fact, our greatest covenant relationship should be always to the Lord God. 
That should be the most important covenant and the most important relationship that we have. God gave himself for our love. He wants us to love him in a covenant relationship, and that's why he paid the price. Could there be any other greater demonstration of his love than to give himself for us? And on that day that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there was a great celebration in heaven. Hallelujah. All of heaven rejoiced when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. God is very passionate about the relationships and very jealous about having us to himself. He doesn't want to share you with anybody. He doesn't want to share me with somebody else. He wants me just like he wants you. And he wants us, he wants us to continue to love him, to serve him, and to give him glory. Jesus said in Luke twenty-two twenty, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. You know, we make lots of covenants in our lives, and we certainly make others in our lives. Our marriage covenant is second only to our covenant with God. Our marriage covenant is second only to covenant with God. And because of that, Satan does all he can to destroy our marriages our families. Satan deliberately attacks the marriage. He deliberately attacks the family because he knows next to our relationship with God, that's the most important relationship we're going to have. Now, he attacks in different ways, and he knows that if he can attack our marriage, it will impact our relationship with God. He knows. He's smart. So he will do all he can to destroy our marriage and destroy our families. Now, some of you have been married to your spouses for many years. But how long have you been married to God? How long have you been married to him? You may ask, well, how is that marriage? What are you talking about? Well, the second most important relationship that you have in this life, like I said, is with your spouse. You are united with your spouse in spirit, in soul, and that is the one person. You become one person. You also have a great celebration and a passion for that person, or at least you should. Genesis 2.24 says that is why man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. One and at the same time, Satan has no greater passion than to destroy our covenant with God. He will do all he can. That's his passion, to destroy our relationship covenant with God. And he wants to destroy our uh, relationship, and he will destroy what he can. And he doesn't want you to give honor he doesn't want you to give glory and praise to Jesus. And one very crafty way he does it is found right here in the book of Malachi. He attacks the covenant relationship of marriage. I see it time and time again, and you probably have seen it. You maybe have felt it, and you've seen others. He attacks marriage, and when he does, and the marriage goes away or hurts, or dissolves, or whatever you want to call it, people's spirituality go away. The relationship with the Lord goes away. Let's look at our text for a second. First, marrying other faith. You know, based on Genesis, we were created to be married. I really do believe that. We're not complete without one another. Husband, wives, men, you're not complete without your wives as bad as you hate what I just said. It's true. You're not complete without your wife. And wives, I'm sorry, you're not complete without your husband. 
because we're made to be one. And, and that's exactly the way we are. we are. We are to be bond with the opposite sex. Now, you notice what I just said, opposite sex. We are, we are to, but made to be bonded with the opposite sex and live as partners for our lives. But when marriage gets to, in the way of our first love, the Lord God, he's our first love. Remember I said the most important covenant is our covenant with God. Then there's going to be something seriously wrong. If I let my marriage to my wife hurt my relationship with God, that's not what God wants. My relationship to God is more important than my relationship to my wife. Now, again, I know that sort of goes against the way some people think and feel, but it's the truth. Now, if we let that happen, so how does that happen? How does it happen? Well, first of all, when we have relationships with those who are not Christians, that's a very dangerous thing to do. It's so dangerous to have a relationship with someone who's not a Christian. Why can't two people, you might say, why can't people, two people have a, a different belief system? Why can't, they, why can't they be tolerant of each other in marriage? Why can't they be two different faiths and be married? Well, first of all, through relationships with those who are not Christians, it's about compromise. Isn't marriage a compromise? Those of you who have been married a few years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to compromise. And God has some strong words to say about this because that is exactly what was happening to the Jews when our scripture was written here in Malachi. They were marrying outside of the faith. Now, we're not talking about Lutherans marrying Baptists or, or Methodists marrying Pentecostals or church. We're not talking about that. This is someone who doesn't believe in the one and only true God. That's what we're talking about. Or maybe they believe in some other God, the wrong God, or God that's not God at all. That's what we're talking about. God said in verse 11, Judah has been unfaithful, a detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying women who worship a foreign god. The scripture here says desecrated. The word means that something is polluted. That is polluted. Now, don't get me wrong. People are not garbage. God doesn't look at people that, as garbage. God loves all people, and he has a desire for all people to be saved. But the point is this, that if you're not forgiven by God and cleansed of your sin through Jesus Christ, who died for you on the cross, then guess what you are doing? You are bearing all of your sin on your shoulders, the entire burden of all your sin, all your shame, and you're dead if you have not come to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Because he's the only one that can take your sin away. You're covered by the filth of your sin and you have no access to God. But on the other hand, a believer is said to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Big difference. The Holy Spirit dwells in the life of a Christian. And how can you bring a worshiper of a foreign God to the temple of God? That's the question. How can you bring worshiper of a foreign god to the temple of God? Now, while many think that it is, I've got to make a statement. Marriage is not evangelism. 
Marriage is not evangelism. We cannot, I repeat, we cannot change someone. In fact, I don't know how many times in marriage counseling I have heard people say that's the most common reason why they marry a non-believer. They say, I will bring him to the Lord, Pastor, don't worry. Or I'll bring her to the Lord. Uh, Now maybe that's good intentions, and I know they have good intentions, but most often the reality is just the opposite. Not all cases, yes, that's not all cases, I admit, because God can do anything, and he does do anything, but many times it's just the opposite. We we think we're strong enough to change someone. Our faith has got to be awful strong to do that. And most of us struggle. Many suffer greatly and have no, they have to compromise. They have to compromise their faith to make their marriage work. That's not what God wants. Don't get me wrong. Again, I must say this. All things are possible with God. All things. And many of you have seen God perform miracles on your spouses and on others. I've seen miracles. But God's Word encourages us to have a relationship in this world in order to to share the gospel. In other words, He wants us to marry other Christians so that together we can share the gospel. We become all things to all men and we reach them with the message of salvation. But marriage is not for the purpose of bringing someone to salvation. It's a covenant. It's a covenant which bonds our spirit, our soul, and our bodies. You are literally one in flesh. When I do a perform a wedding ceremony, I always point that out to them, that in God's eyes, they are becoming one. And it's a commitment of two people who are going in the same direction, in the same, in the same life, and the next one together. Hallelujah. Actually, it's sort of like knitting two souls together to become one. This is why it's such a contradiction if one person who is covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ is united with one that's not. One lives for who? the glory of Jesus. If you're a proper Christian, what are you living for? To glorify Jesus, right? The other one is not glorifying Jesus. They're serving someone else. They're serving, you're serving Jesus. Who are they serving? Are they serving someone else? They are. Who reigns in the marriage? If you have a Christian and a non-Christian, who is Lord of the marriage? Jesus is certainly not Lord over a mixed marriage. He can't because half of the body, remember one, half of the body is not submitted to him. If half of it hasn't submitted to him, then God's not getting any glory. No one can be half in the light and half in the dark. You're either in the light or you're not. And the problem is, Christ will not have full reign in such a marriage. Turn in your Bibles with me. I know this is not a very uh, popular sermon, but I have to preach what God gives me in his word. Uh, Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, would you please? Chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. It's 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. 14 through 18. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 18. Follow along as I read. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
Well, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Bella? What does the believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. Touch, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hmm. What is the Lord saying here? What's he saying? He's saying that anyone who does not serve Christ is ultimately serving the purpose of the enemy. And we know who the enemy is. The enemy is Satan. It doesn't mean that that person is a horrible person. It doesn't mean even that that person is wicked. Not at all. There's lots of good people out in the world that are lost. They don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They're not Christians. Oh, by the worldly standards, they're good people. They're good neighbors. They help the poor. They do sometimes they act better than Christians do. Let's be honest. But they're not Christians. They don't believe in Jesus. But if you're not serving Jesus Christ, who are you serving? If you're not serving Jesus, then who? You might say, well, I'm not serving anybody. I'm serving myself. Yep. I'm serving myself. That means that you're against God. Either you serve God or you are against God. There's no in between. It doesn't matter if you serve Allah or Buddha or your TV or your bank account or your computer or whatever it is that you put before God. If you're not serving God, you're on the side of the enemy because there's no in between. There's no third alternative. It's as bad as you might not like to hear this, it's black and white. You either serve God or you're serving Satan. We either serve God and his purposes or we're ultimately serving the enemy and his purposes and many times we don't even realize it because Satan is the deceiver. He deceives us. You see, you have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. We either choose God or we choose Satan. There's no in-between. It all comes down to a major decision that we must make in life. What is more important, the Lord God or a relationship with someone who is serving the enemy of God? That's the, that's the thing you have to choose. What's more important? You know, Joshua, those of you know back in, father back in the Old Testament, Joshua confronted the people of Israel at the end of his life. He knew that they had to make a choice. They had to make that choice. He knew that the easiest route, the easy thing to do was to compromise. He knew that it was easier to join the people that lived around them, who lived in the land, that would have been much easier to do. In fact, Mary, they're beautiful women and men because they were strong and they were good looking and Mary them. But they could even farm and work and, and do things side by side and unite with them. But he saw something. He knew the terrible consequences of doing that. You see... With time, they would lose their first love. So he challenged them. He challenged the people in Joshua 24, 15. He says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, 
or that the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Notice he only gave them two options. He only gave them two options. There was no third option there or fourth option. Two options, either serve the Lord or not. He didn't say choose if you will serve the Lord or, or choose to serve yourself or choose to serve those gods or choose over there. No, because it's either serve the Lord or serve the enemy. Serve the Lord or serve the enemy. It's your choice. It's your choice. You have to make the choice. That's probably the greatest, most important choice we will ever make in our whole lives. Who do you choose to serve? Many choose themselves. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Number two, unfaithfulness. There's a second area here in which the enemy successfully attacks our relationship to God. And that is, once we're married, even if we're married correctly to another Christian, he attacks our marriage, our present marriage. If he can destroy our faithfulness to our spouse, he can also damage our relationship to God. You see, our relationship with our spouse is intertwined with our relationship to God. God first, spouse second. God first, spouse and family second. Those two relationships rule over all other relationships on the earth. Y'all realize that, right? We have a relationship with God first, and then we have a relationship with our wives, our husbands, our spouses, our children, our family. Those two relationships rule the rest of our relationships all over the world. Now, I've had men argue with me, oh, no, I have to love my wife first. I have to love her with all my heart. I said, no. No, 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 no. If you love God first, you will love your spouse better. It's hard for us to get that, to understand that. But if you love God and follow him and obey him, you will have a better relationship with your wife and with the world. But you have to do that first. And I know it's hard to for our small minds to grasp that sometimes, especially us men. But that's true. That's true. In fact, look at our scripture here back in Malachi chapter 2. Follow along with me as I read chapter 13 through 15 again. 13 through 15, follow along another thing you do. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It's because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. And why one? Because... He was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Amen. It's a partnership of life. Did y'all catch that part? A partnership of life. There's many important aspects about marriage uh, that are crucial in this very short passage. First, Malachi makes the point that marriage is a partnership. In Genesis, Eve and Adam were created to be what? Helpers to each other, side by side, not for part of life, but for lifetime, forever. 
you know, we're all different. Let's be honest. We're as different as we can be. I'm really different from my wife. Even husbands and wives, we're different. We think different, don't we? I know you husbands think different than your wives because I hear you talking. I won't tell them, don't worry. But we think differently. And God made us that way. You see, this is the key. The key is, see those differences as an asset, not as a problem. Think about it. Hey, that's good that he sees it a little bit differently than she does because now we have two different outlooks. But you know, that's not the way we go. This is what we think. I got to win. I I see it different, and I'm the one that's good, and she's going to lose. We got to see. But see, we got to look at their side too, and take it all in consideration. You need you need to receive the the unique insights and abilities and the differences of your spouse as a blessing from God. Look at those differences as a blessing from God. I know it's difficult, men. I've heard you. I know. I have the same feelings sometimes. Guess what? They have the same feelings about us. It's difficult. I understand that. But God made you one. You are together. And if you don't look at it as a blessing from God, Satan will use that to separate you and he'll destroy your marriage if you don't look at it that way. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying that's what God wants us to do. Marriage is a marriage covenant, and the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Malachi also teaches us that marriage is a covenant. It's a vow as much as a relationship to God is a vow to worship only one God, the God, and serve Him. This is not like any friendship or just an acquaintance in life. Marriage is a vow of faithfulness to that one person. And the moment that we view it as something else, a relationship that maybe we can get out of or we can change our mind, whenever we feel like it, we open the door to disaster in our marriage and in our lives and in the family. And you may say, well, why? Because then, instead of making sure we try to work through our problems and work through our differences and work through the issues and, and, and go, growing together, we go together, we simply say, this isn't working. I don't get along with you anymore. I'm not sure I love you anymore. Let's get a divorce. It's funny, but it's sad at the same time. I, because, see, you see, no, 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 no. It's a lifelong covenant of faithfulness. I used to be so laughable, I would try my best not to laugh, when I'd have a young couple come in, well, we just can't communicate anymore. We can't understand each other. We can't communicate. I don't understand her. She don't understand me. We try to talk and we can't. And you know, they were raised like in the same neighborhood in the same block and they went to school together and known each other for 20, 30 years, and they still can't communicate. You see, they're, they're not willing to communicate. Marriage impacts our relationships to God. Malachi teaches here that when we are unfaithful in marriage, we're sinning against God, and our relationship with Him is in danger. Verse 13 says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. There were believers during this time who were married and they worshiped God, yet many were unfaithful to their spouses. 
Notice the attitude here of the believers from that time. Why aren't you accepting me, Lord? You see, they're, they're religious. They're offering sacrifices, and they're worshiping in the temple, but they're still being rejected by God, and they don't know why. They don't know why. They say, why, Lord, will you not accept my offering? I, I come to church, I, I give offerings, I, I worship you. Why don't you accept me? And it's amazing to me that people of God can seem so faithful, but yet they can be totally blind to something in their life, some sin in their life that's so obvious to God. Why is that? All of us. We have blind spots. We can be faithful. We can worship God. We can do all that. But then we have a sin problem and we can't see it. You see, the confrontation was so strong that they were crying out to God and they were crying out to Him in the temple. This can easily be a case for one of us. And I'm not even talking about marriage. I'm talking about all our sin. We can be blind to our own sin. We can. I can. Well, I don't know if I can, you can. We're not that much different. We can be blind to our own sin. It's easy for me to see your sin. It's hard to see my sin sometimes. I think we're all that way. There can be areas in our own lives that we have compromised for so long that we don't see anything wrong with it anymore. We've just kept done it, doing it and doing it and doing it. And at first it bothered us a little bit. We could justify it somehow. And now it don't even bother us anymore, but we know we're sinning. We know we're failing God. But see, God sees it. He sees it. He knows it's sin. He knows what it is. He knows our sin. We won't see anything wrong, but this here was a wake-up call for the Jews. We all have various blind spots in our lives. We're so used to doing things our way doing things that used to bother us, but doesn't bother us anymore. We're so used to doing it. We have areas in our life that are not in order, and yet we don't even see it. But God does. God sees it. Maybe for you it has to do with some aspect of your marriage. Maybe it's something else, or maybe it has to do with a lack of compassion for someone, or... You can't forgive someone or something you've just been struggling with your whole life. It's, and it's hurting your relationship with God. It's probably eating you in, inside a little bit. But you, oh, you're right. You, 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 have every, you have every reason to be angry with that person. You have every reason to be the way you are. But you know it's wrong. And it's bothering you. Or maybe you've compromised morally in an area for so long that you don't even think twice about it anymore. We can get in that kind of life very easily, brothers and sisters. Very easily. Let the Lord speak to your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Get rid of that blind spot. In conclusion this morning, most of you are already married, and you've been married for many years. Remember this. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. All things are possible with God. Hallelujah. If it weren't, I'd be in a bind for sure. But all things are possible with God. John 3, 16-17 says that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn it at all, 
but to save the world through him. Jesus came to heal our brokenness. We're all broken to some degree in different ways, in different fashions. He came to heal me. He came to free us from darkness. Jesus came to give us comfort, to comfort us. In our despair and in our mourning, he's here to comfort us. He's with me right now. He's with you. Receive his comfort because he loves you. He came to restore what was been lost. That's why he came. And the way he does that is by removing the darkness of our sin from our lives. Pray for each other today, would you please? Pray for each other. We need to pray for each other every day. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to your spouse through thick or thin, is a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. I've been married for going on 52 years now, over 51 years. And that's nothing because I know other people have been married much longer than me. But I can tell you from my experience, it takes some patience. It takes some strength. And it takes some work. It's not easy. I'm talking for my wife, not for me. She has a hard time dealing with me and accepting me. And, and, I, and I understand. That's why I make it harder for her, to make her strong. Honey, that's why I do it, is to make her strong. But it does. Doesn't it take work? It does. But it will result when you make it through, of us being more like Jesus. If we work and sacrifice, we be more like Jesus, and we will be blessed, and we'll be a greater blessing to each other than ever before. We'll be a greater blessing to each other if we work together to solve it. God will open doors for a testimony through your life. Please today, if you've never done it, please confess and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the first step. He only wants the best for you. He wants the best for all of us. And he should be our first love. Because if we love him first, then we can make a proper love to everybody else. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as sinners unworthy of you. But you have made a way, and that way is through your Son, his sacrifice for us, his blood, the blood of Jesus, the Christ, our Messiah, the Holy One, Lord. And we agree, Lord, that we need you. We accept you, Lord. We know we're sinners. We know we fail. Lord, we know our relationships are not what they should be. Yes, Lord, in your word it talks about our spouses. But our relationships could be much greater than that. We have relationships with our brothers, our sisters, our families, our cousins, our mothers, our fathers. Lord, we need good relationships, Lord. We need, Lord, you to help us, Lord. Help us to have a right relationship with you first. Lord, thank you that you made us what we are, partners for life. I need help, and flesh help, Lord, is always good to have. But more, Lord, I need the spiritual help that you can give to me. And I pray for those that cannot claim it, Lord, because they have not received you as their Lord and Savior. And we pray as a people, Lord, for the lost. For, Lord, we all need you. Have mercy on us. Let us come to you. Let our hearts be soft for your glory.
For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.